Canada is a country of the enormous natural resources. It is the world's largest exporter of forest products and a top exporter of fish, furs, and wheat. Minerals have played a key role in Canada's transformation into an urban industrial economy. Alberta, British Columbia, Quebec, and Saskatchewan are the principal mining regions. Ontario and the Northwest, NWT, and Yukon Territories are also significant producer of uranium and potash the third largest of asbestos, gypsum, and nickel, and the fourth largest of zinc. Oil and gas are exploited in Alberta, off the Atlantic coast, and in the northwest. Huge additional reserves are thought to exist in the high Arctic. Oil prices making extraction profitable at a growing number of the country's deposit. Canada is also one of the world's top hydroelectricity producers. Okay, another ancient Greek philosopher we need to discuss is Aristotle. Aristotle's ethical theory. What Aristotle's ethical theory is all about is this. He's trying to show you how to be happy and what true happiness is. Now, why is he interested in human happiness? It's not just because it's something that all people want to aim for. It's more than that. But to get there, we need to first make a very important distinction. Let me introduce a couple of technical terms extrinsic value, and intrinsic value. To understand Aristotle's interest in happiness, you need to understand this distinction. Some things we aim for and value, not for themselves, but for what they bring about in addition to themselves. If I value something as a means to something else, then it has what we call extrinsic value, other things we desire and hold to be valuable for themselves alone. If we value something not as a means to something else, but for its own sake, let us say that it has intrinsic value, exercise. There may be some people who value exercise for itself, but I don't. I value exercise if I exercise. I tend to stay healthier than I would if I didn't. So I desire to engage in exercise, and I value exercise extrinsically, not for its own sake, but as a means to something beyond it. It brings me good health. Interviewer. What nutritional guidelines should we be following? Interviewee. Well, probably the best source of nutritional guidelines are those that are issued by the American Cancer Society or the National Cancer Institute. And the American Cancer Society, for example, offers four really basic, simple nutrition guidelines. The first guideline, which in my mind is the most important, is to choose most of the foods that you eat from plant sources, and we can talk in more detail about that in a moment. The second guideline is to limit your intake of high-fat foods, particularly from animal sources. The third guideline is to be physically active and achieve a normal, healthy body weight. And the final guideline is to limit consumption of alcoholic beverages if you choose to drink at all. Interviewer. So Susan, one of the things we always hear about from the American Cancer Society is this five-a-day recommendation. Maybe if you could explain to our listening audience what that actually means. Interviewee. 
The five-a-day recommendation is a very simple way of communicating the message to increase consumption of these plant foods. And what five-a-day means is five servings per day of fruits and vegetables in total. And some people misunderstand this guideline, and they may think it's okay if I have five glasses of fruit juice a day, and I've met my five-a-day guideline. The goal is really to choose both fruits and vegetables as part of the five-a-day guideline, to vary the fruits and vegetables that you eat on a daily basis, and that alone is a very major step forward in terms of reducing your risk for cancer. The glass ceiling is an idea familiar to many. It refers to the invisible barrier that seems to exist in many fields and which presents women from achieving senior positions. Less well known, but arguably a more pernicious problem, is the glass cliff. Originally recognized by academics Michelle Ryan and Alex Haslam back in 2005, this is the phenomenon of women making it to the boardroom but finding themselves disproportionately represented in untenable leadership positions. Ryan and Haslam presented evidence that women were indeed starting to secure seats at boardroom tables, but the problem was their positions were inherently unstable. These women would find themselves in an unsustainable leadership position from which they would be ousted with evidence of apparent failure. The title of their paper sums it up. Women are overrepresented in precarious leadership positions. Subsequent research in an array of environments has demonstrated that this is not an isolated issue nor is it unique to certain industries or geographical locations. It reveals that women in top leadership positions seem to be routinely handed inherently unsolvable problems. There comes a time in a desert ant's life when a piece of food is too large to ignore, but too heavy to lift, and the only way to get it home is to adopt a new style of walking. The long-legged and speedy Cataglyphus fortis normally covers ground with a three-legged stride that moves two legs forwards on one side, and one on the other. For the next step, the insect mirrors the move with its other three legs. But recordings of ants in the Tunisian desert reveal that when faced with oversized lumps of food ten times their own weight, the forward, tripod, walking style is abandoned. Unable to lift the morsels in their mandibles, the ants drag the food backwards instead, moving all six legs independently. This is the first time we have seen this in any ants, said lead author Sarah Pfeffer at the University of Ulm in Germany. The ant's long legs already help keep their bodies away from the scorching desert floor and enable them to speed around at up to 60 centimeters per second. Think of Usain Bolt, who has very long legs compared to body size. The desert floor is also very hot, so the further away their bodies are from the surface, the better, said co-author Matthias Whitlinger. The ants have also evolved to function at body temperatures of 50 degrees Celsius in a desert where temperatures can soar to 70 degrees Celsius. They're basically just trying to get out of the heat, he added. This is the first ocean deployment of two new high-precision instruments designed to monitor the Earth's signals from the seafloor. This housing contains the tilt meter and nanobottom pressure recorder and the associated electronics and cabling used for power and communications. The instruments were deployed on the seafloor by a remotely operated vehicle as part of the Mars Seafloor Observatory test bed located at a depth of 3,000 feet in Monterey Bay. In this first test deployment in the ocean, they have already detected the ground motion from several large earthquakes, as far from the Mars site as Chile and the Mariana Trench. In the future, the instruments will be part of a global network of cabled seafloor observatories. Because of their precision, these two new instruments are already detecting signals which could never be measured before.
Over the last decade, the share of the world's population living under autocracy increased from 48 to 68 percent. It is more important than ever to understand how autocracies work. Autocrats have a keen interest in promoting the idea that they are all-powerful, whereas leaders in democracies can be removed via elections. Leaders in autocracies can lose office in two ways, via a coup or popular revolt. To make matters worse, autocrats can rarely address both threats at the same time. They often have to choose whether to reward their elite cronies to prevent a coup or the masses to prevent a revolt. This generates many difficult trade-offs. Cheat too little on elections and risk losing office, but cheat too much and signal weakness to your opponents. Use corruption to reward your elite friends, but not so much that it slows economic growth and sparks revolt. Manipulate the media, but not so much that people turn off the television. Repress your political opponents, but not so much that it causes a backlash. Empower the security services, but not so much that they can overthrow you. Rulers who fail to resolve these trade-offs often suffer the consequences. It's time for this young loggerhead turtle to go to work. We can tether turtles in these little cloth harnesses, put them into this tank and dull swimming place. University of North Carolina biologist Ken Lohman studies sea turtles that are programmed from birth for an extraordinary journey. Mother turtles buried their eggs on the beach and then returned to the sea, and the eggs hatch about 50 to 60 days later. Support for the National Science Foundation... Lohman is learning how these reptiles use the Earth's magnetic field to navigate a 5-10 to ten year journey around the Atlantic Ocean. The turtles seem to inherit a set of responses that tell them what to do when they encounter specific magnetic fields at particular locations. This animal magnetism can be a lifesaver, and one field off Portugal triggers the turtles to turn south. If they don't, they likely die, swept into frigid North Atlantic waters. In one lab, test turtles responded to magnetic field similarly to what they would encounter off the coast of Florida. The great majority of them turned southeast. This is an exciting finding because southeasterly orientation in this part of the world would presumably take turtles further into the Gulf Stream. So, the turtles actually have what might be considered a crude global positioning system that is based on the Earth's magnetic field. And check out this experiment. These turtles' moves may look odd. The turtles will actually act out their swimming behavior in air. But this wave simulator recreates the first environmental cue hatchling turtles respond to. Swimming into waves is a highly reliable trick that the turtles use to guide themselves offshore. Um, but I think, just to put it in a nutshell, that many basic social values are passed on unconsciously already in babyhood. Adults convey a great deal to babies about the kind of society they're living in. Um, you know, at the most basic level, for example, whether their world is supportive and safe or challenging and dangerous. And all of us, in different ways, <coughs> are working with the unloving side of society, in a way, and trying to find ways to offer a more caring response. And particularly those people who are working in Africa are often doing really cutting-edge work in dealing with traumatic social problems, such as the AIDS epidemic, um, the aftermath of war, homelessness, and so on. Whilst um, probably the majority of you who've actually made it here today um, are pouring your creative energy into, I'm sure, wonderful but probably more tried and tested um, kind of projects.
So there are two theories for how the gas giants formed. One is the same theory I showed you just now, core accretion, right? And the other is called disk instability. And one of um, our colleagues at DTM um, has done a lot of work on that. And so it's unclear exactly how they formed, but you're right, what we're trying to do, the reason we're trying to get to higher and higher pressure in the lab is because we're trying to understand more about the pressure inside the gas giants. It's thought that the gas giants also have a metallic core, but maybe a metallic core not made of iron. Hydrogen, for example, becomes metallic at a certain pressure. Okay, so, so it's very possible that the insides of these planets um, could have metallic cores, could have hydrogen cores, could have uh, rocky portions. We're not sure, but the higher pressure we can get in the lab, the higher the pressure we can get in the lab, the closer we can get to understanding the interiors of the gas giants and the exoplanets that are so big. Women systematically underestimate their own abilities. If you test men and women and you ask them questions on totally objective criteria like GPAs, men get it wrong slightly high and women get it wrong slightly low. Women do not negotiate for themselves in the workforce. A study in the last two years of people entering the workforce at a college showed that 57% of boys entering, or men, I guess, are negotiating for salary and only 7% of women. And most importantly, men attribute their success to themselves, and women attribute it to other external factors. If you ask men why they did a good job, they'll say, I'm awesome. If you ask, obviously, why are you even asking? If you ask women why they did a good job, what they'll say is someone helped them, and they got lucky. They worked really hard. Why does this matter? Boy, it matters a lot, because no one gets to the corner office by sitting on the side not at the table, and no one gets the promotion if they don't think they deserve their success or they don't even understand their own success. The preservation of embryos and juveniles is a rate occurrence in the fossil record. The tiny, delicate skeletons are usually scattered by scavengers or destroyed by weathering before they can be fossilized. Ichiosaurus had a higher chance of being preserved than did terrestrial creatures because, as marine animals, they tend to live in environments less subject to erosion. Still, their fossilization required a suite of factors, a slow rate of decay of soft tissues, little scavenging by other animals, a lack of swift currents and waves to jumble and carry away small bones, and fairly rapid burial. Given these factors, some areas have become a treasury of well-preserved ichiosaur fossils. The deposits at Halls Made in Germany present an interesting case for analysis. The ichiosaur remains are found in black, bitmonious marine shells deposited about 190 million years ago. Over the years, thousands of specimens of marine reptiles, fish, and invertebrates have been recovered from these rocks. The quality of preservation is outstanding, but what is even more impressive is the number of ichiosaur fossils containing preserved embryos. Ichiosaurs with embryos have been reported from six different levels of the shale in a small area around Hull's Maiden, suggesting that a specific site was used by large numbers of ichiosaurs repeatedly over time. The embryos are quite advanced in their physical development. Their paddles, for example, are already well formed. One specimen is even preserved in the birth canal. In addition, the shell contains many remains of many newborns that are between 20 and 30 inches long. Why are there so many pregnant females and young at Hall's Maiden, and why are they so rare elsewhere? The quality of preservation is almost unmatched, and quarry operations have been carried out carefully with an awareness of the value of the fossils. But these factors do not account for the interesting question of how they came to be such a concentration of pregnant ichiosaurs in a particular place very close to the time of giving birth.
Today I would like to talk about a book in this class. This book focuses on architecture design in London. Not just any place in London. It is in the west side of London, called West Street of London. The architecture made a very poor design of the buildings there. This can cause a mood swing. An awful design of the buildings can have a negative influence on people's mood. If you want some beautiful designs, then you must visit Stanford and Frankfurt. They are good examples of the best architectural designs. Different architects have different perspectives on beauty, which is an arrogant word since it's, an eye, it's in the eye of the beholder. One can write the out in the play, but how can one design bad and ugly buildings? Well, it is difficult for architects to realize a bad architectural design. Community service is an important component of education here at our university. We encourage all students to volunteer for at least one community activity before they graduate. A new community program called One on One helps elementary students who've fallen behind. Your education majors might be especially interested in it because it offers the opportunity to do some teaching, that is, tutoring in math and English. You'd have to volunteer two hours a week for one semester. You can choose to help a child with math, English, or both. Half-hour lessons are fine, so you could do a half-hour of each subject two days a week. Professor Dodge will act as a mentor to the tutors. He'll be available to help you with lesson plans or to offer suggestions for activities. He has office hours every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon. You can sign up for the program with him and begin the tutoring next week. I'm sure you'll enjoy this community service and you'll gain valuable experience at the same time. It looks good on your resume, too, showing that you've had experience with children and that you care about your community. If you'd like to sign up, or if you have any questions, stop by Professor Dodge's office this week. For many, these have been vital considerations for the future of artificial intelligence. But British computer scientist Alan Turing decided to disregard all these questions in favor of a much simpler one. Can a computer talk like a human? This question led to an idea for measuring artificial intelligence that would famously come to be known as the Turing test. In the 1950 paper Computing Machinery and Intelligence, Turing proposed the following game. A human judge has a text conversation with unseen players and evaluates their responses. To pass the test, a computer must be able to replace one of the players without substantially changing the results. In other words, a computer would be considered intelligent if its conversation couldn't be easily distinguished from a human's. Turing predicted that by the year 2000, machines with 100 megabytes of memory would be able to easily pass his test. But he may have jumped the gun. Socialism. The word invented in the late 1810s, communism, the word first appeared in 1840. None of these things were words, much less ideologies before the French Revolution, and the French Revolution gives birth to much of the modern political world. Have you not wondered why we refer to the political left and the political right? Does this have any inherent bodily signification? No. Left and right in politics comes from the original designation of the deputies who sat to the left of the speaker podium and those who sat to the right of the speaker podium in the National Assembly of the 1789 to 1790. The left were those who were seen as progressive wanting to change, the right were seen as those wanting to conserve elements of the old regime.
We appear to take it as a rule, or as a law of nature, that each species is adapted to the climate of its own home. For example, species from the Arctic, or a temperate region, could not survive in a tropical climate, nor could a tropical species last long if it found itself at the South Pole. But it is true to say there's too much emphasis placed on the degree of adaptation of species to the climates where they live. We assume that this adaptation, if all species are descended from a single form, must have taken place over millions of years, yet a large number of plants and animals brought from different countries remain perfectly healthy in their new home. Also, there are several examples of animal species that have extended their range within historical times from warmer to cooler latitudes and the other way around. Rats and mice provide good examples. They have been transported by man to many parts of the world and now have a far wider range than any other rodent, and they can be found living in the cold climate of Faroe Islands to the north through the tropical zones to the Falkland Islands in the south. It is possible to see adaptation to any climate as a quality that is part of an inborn flexibility of the physical and mental constitution of most animals. Therefore, the ability to survive in most different climates by both man and his domestic animals, and the fact that elephants once existed in an ice age while living species live in tropical areas, should not be seen as deviations from the rule, but as examples of this flexibility being brought into action under particular circumstances. Theater study is a difficult subject in the academy because it cannot be experimental and it is a mixture of literature and personal life experience. Theater should show pure lives, although there will be new actors or directors. It is also a collection of different skills, such as writing and singing. To succeed in this subject, you need the knowledge of linguistics, sociology, archaeology, physics, psychology, and philosophy. Theater study is interdisciplinary, and you need to be a linguistic and archaeologist to fully understand theater study. If we move everything away, there are some intellectual and distinctive things left. What makes theater study distinctive is that it's an ongoing project that requires a study lifespan of 60 to 70 years. Machiavelli lived from 1469 to 1527. The philosopher Bernard Russell referred to Machiavelli's most well-known book, The Prince, as a gangster's handbook. And while there's no doubt that certain people have read and used it as such, I think that if we put it into context of when it was written, which was Italy, especially Florence, in the 15th and 16th centuries, it will be easier to judge Machiavelli's reasons for writing it. Now, the Italy of that period was made up of a number of city-states, often at war with each other. Add to that threats from foreign powers, especially France, and it was a very unstable and dangerous situation. Machiavelli loved his home city, Florence, and wanted to protect its culture, history, and above all, independence at all costs. One way to do this was to establish an army of Florentines loyal to the city-state of Florence. Much of Machiavelli's career was taken up with this issue. It must be remembered, though, that he led an active civic life, was deeply into politics, and was an ambassador for Florence. In this way, he got to meet and observe some of the key players of the time, and through this came to understand the nature of power and how to hold on to it. The prince was an attempt to teach Florence the lessons he had learned. One of the things I love about working on ice is it's actually just visually very beautiful. The Antarctic is a beautiful and exceptional place to work. Much of what I do is to try to understand changes in climate um, over the last hundreds to thousands to even hundreds of thousands of years. 
An ice core is a continuous section of ice drilled into a glacier or an ice sheet. We're sending this instrument down, which is just a cutting tool, and the thing goes down a meter at a time. You bring it up and now you have these long tubes of ice. Drilling an ice core is kind of like a time machine. You can go back and find out what was the atmosphere like 50,000 years ago. It's snow that has fallen and it, then it's compressed, trapping the atmosphere. You can count the layers in ice cores like you can count tree rings. And that means that you can actually determine when certain events in climate happened within a few years. The Right Honorable Sir Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill was a British statesman, best known as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom during the Second World War. At various times a soldier, journalist, author, and politician, Churchill is generally regarded as one of the most important leaders in British and world history. Considered reactionary on some issues, such as granting independence to Britain's colonies, and at times regarded as a self-promoter who changed political parties to further his career. It was his wartime leadership that earned him iconic status. Some of his peacetime decisions, such as restoring the gold standard in 1924, were disastrous, as was his World War I decision to land troops on the Dardanelles. However, during 1940, when Britain alone opposed Hitler's Nazi Germany in the free world, his stirring speeches inspired, motivated, and uplifted a whole people during their darkest hours. Churchill saw himself as a champion of democracy against tyranny and was profoundly aware of his own role and destiny. Indeed, he believed that God had placed him on earth to carry out heroic deeds for the protection of Christian civilization and human progress. A providential understanding of history would concur with Churchill's self-understanding. Considered old-fashioned, even reactionary by some people today, he was actually a visionary whose dream was of a united world, beginning with a union of the English-speaking peoples, then embracing all cultures. In his youth, he cut a dashing figure as a cavalry officer as seen in the 1972 film Young Winston, directed by Richard Attenborough, but the images of him that are most widely remembered are as a rather overweight, determined, even pugnacious looking senior state statesman as he is depicted to the right. Tissue engineering, what is it? It's an emerging field, uh, interdisciplinary field, that combines engineering and life sciences to create functional biological structures that can restore and improve tissue function. Examples include bladders, trachea, and blood vessels. And um, if you look at it, printing as a technology has also gone through a revolution. Uh, while it's been around for hundreds of years, in the last couple decades, it's gained a new dimension. We can now print layer by layer in materials ranging from plastic to metal to concrete to chocolate, uh, from the smallest scales to the largest. If we take 3D printing and we uh, combine it with biology, we have bioprinting, where the building blocks are cell aggregates, what we call bioink particles, that are composed of thousands of uh, cells that can fuse together into different uh, shapes. These geometries can include multi-layered sheets, uh, such as skin, uh, branching tubes uh, for vasculature, um, and the sophistication of this manufacturing technology uh, improves daily uh, to include different cell types um, and different shapes. Now, why is this important? Well, the pharmaceutical industry is in a moment of crisis. It spends more money each year on R&D, but has fewer drugs to show for it. It takes more than a decade, more than a billion dollars to develop a new drug, and the cost of failure can be measured in hundreds of millions of dollars.
In today's class, we've been examining some 19th century pattern books that were used for building homes. I think it's fair to say that these pattern books were the most important influence on the design of North American houses during the 19th century. This was because most people who wanted to build a house couldn't afford to hire an architect. Instead, they bought a pattern book, picked out a plan, and took it to the builder. The difference in cost was substantial. In 1870, for example, hiring an architect would have cost about $100. At the same time, a pattern book written by an architect cost only $5. At that price, it's easy to see why pattern books were so popular. Some are back in print again today, and of course, they cost a lot more than they did 100 years ago. But they're an invaluable resource for historians, and also for people who restore old houses. I have a modern reprint here, and I'll be passing around the room in a moment so that everyone can have a look. Today, I would like to focus on some of the important features of academic writing. The quality is the first most aspect of any writing. When you write about history, you need half the same quality as journal writing. They are both similar. When you are writing academic and journal papers, you might consider some of these factors. Both require resources and evidence as well as writing style. Furthermore, the attention of logic in writing is also important. One thing that puzzles me is that there is no clear connection between history and journal writing, but somehow they are so much alike. Frogs are a diverse and largely carnivorous group of short-bodied, tailless amphibians composing the order Inura. The oldest fossil proto-frog appeared in the early Triassic of Madagascar, but molecular clock dating suggests their origins may extend further back to the Permian, 265 million years ago. Frogs are widely distributed, ranging from the tropics to subarctic regions, but the greatest concentration of species diversity is found in tropical rainforests. There are approximately 4,800 recorded species, accounting for over 85% of extant amphibian species. They are also one of the five most diverse vertebrate orders. Besides living in fresh water and on dry land, the adults of some species are adapted for living underground or in trees. Adult frogs generally have a carnivorous diet consisting of small invertebrates, but omnivorous species exist and a few feed on fruit. Frogs are extremely efficient at converting what they eat into body mass. They are an important food source for predators and part of the food web dynamics of many of the world's ecosystems. The skin is semi-permeable, making them susceptible to dehydration, so they either live in moist places or have special adaptations to deal with dry habitats. Frogs produce a wide range of vocalizations, particularly in their breeding season, and exhibit many different kinds of complex behaviors to attract mates, to fend off predators and to generally survive. Frog populations have declined significantly since the 1950s. More than one-third of species are considered to be threatened with extinction and over 120 are believed to have become extinct since the 1980s. The number of malformations among frogs is on the rise and an emerging fungal disease, chytridiomycosis, has spread around the world. Conservation biologists are working to understand the causes of these problems and to resolve them. Frogs are valued as food by humans and also have many cultural roles in literature, symbolism and religion. There comes a time in a desert ant's life when a piece of food is too large to ignore, but too heavy to lift, and the only way to get it home is to adopt a new style of walking. The long-legged and speedy Cataglyphus fortis normally covers ground with a three-legged stride that moves two legs forwards on one side, and one on the other. For the next step, the insect mirrors the move with its other three legs. 
but recordings of ants in the Tunisian desert reveal that when faced with oversized lumps of food ten times their own weight, the forward tripod walking style is abandoned. Unable to lift the morsels in their mandibles, the ants drag the food backwards instead, moving all six legs independently. This is the first time we have seen this in any ants, said lead author Sarah Pfeffer at the University of Ulm in Germany. The ants' long legs already help keep their bodies away from the scorching desert floor and enable them to speed around at up to 60 cm per second. Think of Usain Bolt, who has very long legs compared to body size. The desert floor is also very hot, so the further away their bodies are from the surface, the better, said co-author Matthias Whitlinger. The ants have also evolved to function at body temperatures of 50 degrees Celsius in a desert where temperatures can soar to 70 degrees Celsius. They're basically just trying to get out of the heat, he added. The way I started really, I was doing this type of work in United States where there are a number of lawyers doing it and it had not been done in the UK with the rest of Europe before. I think the reason I started in the United States was that there was a civil rights movement. And in the civil rights movement, lawyers became deeply involved right away because if you're black civil rights you're arrested. So the environmental movement coming along just behind the civil rights movement in time and said ah, we need lawyers and environment movement as well. As a result, one of the main contributors to the environment now is how has been its lawyers. Here there were no need for civil rights movement, so environmental groups became expert campaigners, but law really wasn't part of the deal and never has happened, they never use law strategically, they would say they have. I came here and one of our interviewed people and environmental groups in UK, in Brussels and so on and was very surprised of the positive views of law and that's where client came from, so bringing their kind of intellectual DNA and work I've done in the United States into these very difficult cultures. With an abundance of low-priced labor relative to the United States, it's no surprise that China, India, and other developing countries specialize in the production of labor-intensive products. For similar reasons, the United States will specialize in the production of goods that are human and physical capital intensive because of the relative abundance of highly educated labor force and technically sophisticated equipment in the United States. This division of global population should yield higher global output of both types of goods than would be the case if each country attempted to produce both of these goods itself. For example, the United States would produce more expensive labor-intensive goods because of its more expensive labor, and the developing countries would produce more expensive human and physical capital-intensive goods because of their relative scarcity of these inputs. This logic implies that the United States is unlikely to be a significant global competitor in the production of green technologies that are not relatively intensive in human and physical capital. Nevertheless, during the early stages of the development of a new technology, the United States has a comparative advantage in the production of the products enabled by this innovation. However, once these technologies become well understood and production processes are designed that can make use of less skilled labor, production will migrate to countries with less expensive labor. <laughs> 